Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, the title is uh, the same, and uh, uh, the third lecture will consist on a quick review, some of the main recent advances about which I talked last time. Then I will talk about uh, the axiomatic polarized spacetime, uh, the main result that I, I want to present today, which is in collaboration with uh, Jeremy Seftel, the main features uh, of the construction and the proof. Okay, so let me start. So again, the conjecture was uh, <coughs> that we discussed last time. This is a general conjecture on the stability of care, namely that uh, you have small perturbation of a given care. Uh, and of course, you are interested only in the exterior part, which uh, is this one here. Uh, <coughs> initial conditions have, <coughs> so if you take a perturbation of uh, the care solution uh, on such a space-like hypersurface, uh, you would converge to uh, another care solution, which will have uh, parameters a f final A and final M. All right, so uh, y last time, which it means yesterday, I talked about the general stability problem, so let me uh, recall very fast. So we look at nonlinear equations uh, where you have already a solution, which is phi zero. Uh, typically, phi zero is going to be a stationary solution that we're interested in. And uh, psi is some small perturbation. You start with initial data, which are small, and the question is what happens in the largest t goes to infinity. Uh, orbital stability will mean that psi remains bounded for all time. Uh, asymptotic stability will mean that psi goes to uh, zero, and also the perturbation converges to zero as t goes to infinity. And uh, uh, it's natural to look at the linearized problem, uh, which is this one. So this is a linear operator. You just take the, the variation of n, or the, the Frechette derivative if you want, and you get a, a system of linear equations in the psi, which you want to solve. And then at the level of the linear equation, you can talk about mode stability, which is uh, the simplest kind of stability that you can think of, uh, which means, in particular, that you don't have growing modes. Boundedness, which means that psi stays bounded for all time. And uh, quantitative decay, which is a real important one if you want to understand the nonlinear equation, which is that you actually uh, want to get enough decay of psi so that you can close the, non, uh, the level of the nonlinear problem. And then uh, uh, I had a discussion, we had a discussion about the kernel of this linear operator, and we saw that uh, due to the presence of a continuous family of stationary solutions phi lambda, uh, this implies that there has to be something in the kernel which you can identify, and uh, uh, the conclusion of this will be that the final state has to differ from the initial state. Okay, so this is the first, the first ca kind of instability at the level of the linear equation uh, that you should expect. Uh, an even more severe form uh, of instability, of this kind of instability, which is uh, the fact that you can have a, pr uh, a continuous family of invariant diffeomorphism which keep the equations invariant. Right, so in particular for the Einstein equations, which I, I uh, mentioned from the beginning, is that if you have a solution of Ricci equal to zero, then uh, phi star of g is also a solution. So therefore, you have a four, in fact, a, a four-parameter uh, groups of uh, diffeomorphisms, continuous groups of diffeomorphisms, which lead, therefore, to this kind of very severe. Uh, uh, instability. It's not a real instability if you think about the nonlinear problem, but if you really look at just the linear problem, you should expect to have those. And therefore, you have to somehow be able to mod them out. So uh, the, 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 the important question to keep in mind at the level of linear equations is that you are interested in quantitative linear stability, which, sh which you should define. The correct definition would be that after you account for 1 and 2, in other words, you kind of take you mod out these bad mods, then uh, everything else should decay sufficiently fast. Sufficiently fast so that you can close at the level of the nonlinear problem. Okay? And then uh, uh, if you want to connect this kind of quantitative linear stability with the nonlinear equations, and you do modulate what is called modulation theory, which is something that has been developed typically for much simpler problems. And today we'll have to discuss what happens at 
in the case of Einstein equations, where all, all these uh, linear instabilities are much, much more serious. All right, so uh, and modulation, modulation, I should say, is a way of, you see, you understand that you, you cannot just look at a linearization around phi zero. You have to look at around, uh, linearization around the family of solutions that converge to the final state. So the correct way, no linear theory could actually do the nonlinear problem because you actually have to, you, you have to dynamically track the correct linearization also, so to speak, right? Because you, you want to linearize, if you go from phi zero to, to final, the final state, you have to have a continuous linearization for all the intermediate states. Okay, so anyway, so this is uh, what we discussed last time. Uh, we had a, 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 I had a general discussion about geometric framework of, insta of uh, stability. Uh, and uh, uh, if you remember, we talk about uh, so-called principal null directions of care. So if you are exactly in care, there are two null directions at every point of the space-time. There are two null directions, uh, which have the property that uh, if you decompose a curvature tensor relative to them, you get uh, only two components of the curvature tensor are different from zero, and everything else is zero. So it's a, some kind of very natural diagonalization that is given by these principal null directions. Uh, the, uh, there is an horizontal structure associated with it, which means that uh, you look at, if you have this, these two vectors, C3, E4, so let's say this is E3, this is E4, then you look at the tangents, you look at a space perpendicular to them, and you, here you have two more. Uh, vectors e1, e2, and together they form a null frame, right? So, uh, so these are the null frames. Then once you have the frame, you do decomposition. You look at the Ricci coefficients, which are just derivatives of the frame relative to, express derivative of the frame relative to the frame itself. You get a lot of connection coefficients, which I, I call gamma. We had specific, uh, specific components of these uh, connection coefficients. But in this lecture, I, I'm not going to be too specific until the very end, maybe. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the curvature also, uh, the curvature tensor can be decomposed. Th this is a little bit more important. The curvature, if you decompose it relative to the frame, you get uh, components, which are alpha and alpha bar, which are we call the, ex <coughs> which are the extreme components. And these are defined by, by taking R and and uh, multiplying it twice by E4. And then this here would be E3, E3. And everything else would be uh, tangential components. And then uh, you, have, uh, you have the other components, which are beta, beta bar, uh, rho, and rho star, uh, which are defined this time. Beta will have only one uh, E3 component and two E4 components, and so on and so forth. So it's not too important to know exactly what they are. The important thing is that all components of the curvature can be described by these null decompositions of the curvature tensor. Uh, and then uh, we discussed about this uh, O of epsilon perturbation, so I'll, I'll repeat, and the frame transformations and uh, invariant quantities and uh, main equations. So let's repeat it. Uh, so in particular, I want to repeat this uh, perturbation, so for the epsilon. So uh, again, if you are uh, in care, then uh, as I already said, these quantities are automatically zero relative to the principal null directions. So the simplest kind of perturbative analysis that I can make is I say, well, my space time that I want to construct is going to be an O of epsilon perturbation of the, of the care solution, which means that everything that was zero in care would uh, be now O of epsilon, right? So in other words, there is, there are, Principal null direction, some, something that looks like principal null directions, they are not principal null directions anymore. Uh, but but uh, approximately, uh, you, uh, you have these frames uh, which give you these components O of epsilon. So everything which is zero becomes O of epsilon, right? So in particular, there are some components of the Ricci coefficients which were zero in care and which are also going to be O of epsilon. All right, so then as I expressed last time, yes? No, for the moment, no, the simplest, I mean, you know, orbital if you want, okay? So I, I don't know exactly, I don't know what the perturbation is, but locally I, I imagine that it's not going to be more than O of epsilon from, right? But then, I, of course, I'll have to construct it, and that's a different story. So, uh, but I, I want to understand the dependence 
uh, of the frame in particular. Because once you, you see, once you have such a definition, then it's not clear what frame you are talking about. There are many, many null frames which will give you this kind of behavior, right? Okay, infinity many uh, frames. In fact, I, I can see exactly how you get from one frame to another by performing a frame transformation. So I have a null frame here, and I get to a new null frame by uh, uh, this kind of expressions, right? So EA refers to the tangential components, the E3, E4. Uh, and the F, I, I can think of F and F bar as being all of epsilon. So they are all of epsilon coefficients. And uh, everything which is epsilon square, so by the way, it's extremely important to sort of realize that everything which is all of epsilon square, you don't see in linear theory at all. But even in the nonlinear, and of course we are interested in the nonlinear equations, in the nonlinear equations, you can hope that these quadratic terms are much easier to treat. There is something like a null condition that allows you. So somehow, at the beginning of the game, we, we want to forget about these all of epsilon square terms. So everything which, is, uh, which gives you all of epsilon square is good from uh, this very simplified analysis. And then sort of the, the remarkable fact that you observe is that the, the extreme components of the curvature, which are this alpha, alpha bar, are in fact all of epsilon square invariant. Right? Which gives you a first big breakthrough on the problem because now you can concentrate exactly on these things which do not depend too much. I mean, remember that the most difficult thing in all this business is, is uh, the, the huge, <coughs> huge uh, group of covariants that the Einstein equations have. So if you have some quantities which, are, which behave better, which are not too sensitive about the frame, then of course you, are, uh, you, are already, uh, you have something important to start with. And also, uh, I, I want to remind you, we discussed it last time, that in the case of the stability of Minkowski space, any component of the, all components of the curvature are of epsilon square invariant. And it's because of this that somehow we, we could have, we were uh, concentrating just on curvature, on the Bianchi identities, and we were using the Bianchi identities to control the curvature. And then once you control the curvature, then you have to fix the gauge. And you, we discussed a little bit about how to fix the gauge in the stability of the Minkowski space. And that was uh, a little bit more complicated. And of course, the gauge and the gain had to do with this. Right? Another, another big simplification in the stability of Minkowski space is that the final state, there is no issue of the final state. The final state still has to be Minkowski. If you start with Minkowski, it's very easy to see the final state has to still be Minkowski, which is not the case in uh, stability of. Uh, OK, so that's. Uh, the review, the, we had also the basic equations, the uh, null structure equation, uh, which I uh, try to very schematically describe. So here we had, uh, again, you, you, you had the, the frame, you had the Ricci coefficients, and the curvature. Now, in the stability of Minkowski space, as I explain, the curvature uh, should be viewed as part of a hyperbolic system, which are the Bianchi. So these are the Bianchi equations, which we discussed uh, last time. So they are treated in a certain way. And again, because of this all of epsilon square invariant, the estimates that you have there are not too much dependent on the Ricci coefficients. right? They are not too dependent on kind of uh, uh, coordinate conditions or, or uh, frame conditions that you make. Once you have the curvature, Right? Then you can, in principle, think of uh, the connection, the equation satisfied by connection coefficients. You think about Cartan formalism. Cartan, Cartan equations give you uh, equations for, for the Ricci coefficients in terms of curvature. And they look very roughly like this. Of course, they are more complicated. And of course, there are different components, and so on and so forth. But roughly, they look like this. And then you can see that somehow, if you know the curvature, you can use transport equations to determine the gammas. Okay? And uh, then, of course, the big, still important thing is that whenever you have transport equations, and uh, we discussed it last time, whenever you have transport equations, right, you, you, it, it means you, you have some ordinary differential equations along null geodesics in our case. Right? The E3 and E4 correspond to uh, null directions. Uh, you have to initiate the, uh, this transport equation somewhere. Okay? So you can initiate. Uh, many possibilities, but the initialization is going to play a fundamental role in everything one does, right? So if you initialize, you can initialize at infinity, or you can initialize somewhere else, but this is going to play and play for the role. I see that Nikalis completely agrees with me. Good. So uh, 
the, uh, so these are the equations. That, there are also some elliptic equations, in fact, which are, which are called the Kodatsi equation. And then finally, we have the Nalbianchi equations, which, uh, again, you, I, I just wrote them here to show how different they are from uh, the Kodatsi equation. They are, uh, they are not transport equations anymore. In fact, as we saw, they are hyperbolic equations, so they have to be solved. All right, so the, uh, when you look at the stability of, of Kerr and you compare it to the stability of Minkowski space, which we discussed a little bit last time, uh, is uh, the first thing that you observe is that some of the null curvature component which are the, not the alpha and alpha bar, which are the extreme one, but the beta, beta bar, uh, are, not, uh, of, are only of epsilon invariant. They are not of epsilon square invariant. So that's a, sort of the first important thing that you observe. Uh, so uh, so it, you conclude that the null decomposition of the curvature tensor is actually sensitive to frame transformations. You expect, in fact, if you look at just the Bianchi equations, the way we did in the stability of Minkowski space, you are going to have stationary states. So you are not going to be able to analyze, you will not be able to do the same analysis that we did in the stability of Minkowski space. And uh, therefore, you have to do something else. And uh, another, so we'll discuss it in the next slide. Another thing uh, is that the principal null directions are not integrable. So this means that uh, in care, uh, in care, you, you have this, <laughs> this, uh, this frame, principal null frame. And then we took the space perpendicular to it. The space perpendicular to it is not necessarily, I mean, it's not integrable in care, right? It is integrable in Schwarzschild, and it's integrable in Minkowski space. And that's another reason why stability of Minkowski space was easier. All right, so, uh, so another difficulty relative to stability of Minkowski space is that you have to track this parameter, AF and MF, of the uh, final care and the correct gauge condition. And this has to emerge dynamically. Uh, as we discussed last time. Uh, and then uh, finally, there is another major problem, which is that there are obstacles to prove decay even for the simplest equations, like the wave equations in CAD. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess we had, uh, we discussed uh, a lot how these sort of things uh, can be handled. So all the difficulties, and there are many, and you know, difficulties which 15 years ago looked really fundamental and which now are understood uh, based on sort of a new version uh, of uh, the vector field method, right? So, uh, and, and something else which we discussed a little bit last time. All right, so now, what are the main recent advances? Again, uh, first one I mentioned last time, mentioned yesterday, the, the first uh, sort of conceptual breakthrough, even though it was very simple in a certain sense, was that uh, t was a remark made by Teukowski that this, uh, this extreme components of the curvature, alpha and alpha bar, verify some wave equations which are decoupled at linear level from everything else. Right? So this is the first clue, because this alpha and alpha bar are invariant, also of epsilon square invariant. And they also, by the way, you can actually almost conclude that such equations should exist just based on the fact that you have this of epsilon square in, in, invariant for uh, alpha, alpha bar. And, and anyway, but that, that's not too important. All right, so this is the first big thing. Think you get equations. Uh, those equations can be analyzed by mode analysis. And in fact, uh, if physicists uh, were able to conclude that there are no, uh, no uh, exponentially growing modes. Okay, so that's, uh, unfortunately, however, the equations don't have, uh, the, are not Lagrangian, they are not derivable from a Lagrangian, they are not coercive directly in, in, in the sense of having energy estimates. And therefore, the, if you just look at the Teukowski equation, you, you cannot implement all the methodology uh, that was developed uh, in uh, the last, as I said, in the last 15 years. Another important advance was made by Chandra Seka, which was immediately after, which observed that there is a transformation that takes you from these uh, Teukowski equations, which, which have problems, to an equation which is well behaved, which is a Regu Wheeler equation. Uh, so this was done using mode decomposition, and I, I don't think it was used much by people until uh, uh, the Fermos Holzegel and Rodniansky, who saw how to use this Chandra second transformation, in fact, they were able to, to write, to express it in terms of uh, 
physical quantity, so there, are, there is no more decomposition needed. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, with this, they were able to sort of go back and, and study the, the, the co conclude that the Tarkovsky equation also has uh, good properties in the sense of having uh, uh, boundedness and, and, uh, and decay, quantitative decay. Uh, so this is a classical uh, new uh, classical and new vector field method. The classical method is the one which was used in the stability of the Minkowski space. The new vector field method, which again has developed in the last 15 or maybe even more years, no, 15 years, I think. I think we can say starting with 2003, uh, which uh, uh, has led to uh, reformulation of the vector field method, which made it much more flexible and able to deal with, with the problems that have uh, the problems of uh, studying just simple wave equations on a Kerr background. Okay, so again, this I, I discussed last time. So uh, in summary, what we understand today is that in light of the recent advances, we now have tools to control, control in principle alpha alpha bar, not just for Schwarzschild, but also uh, in Kerr. Okay, so this is something again that I talked last time and I'm not going to talk much more. So the fact that you can, when I say in principle, I say that it's, uh, at this stage, it's only at the linear level. If you want to do it at a non-linear level, in connection with the true stability of care, then uh, you have to work much harder because uh, the equations, so for example, this uh, Reggie-Wheeler equation that appeared in our discussion uh, yesterday, uh, which look like this uh, if you are in care. So this is a <coughs> so this is a Schwarzschild solution. Uh, of course, I if you deal with a true nonlinear problem, then this has to also be perturbed. And more than this, there will be error terms here. So the the quadratic error terms, which <coughs> until now we cavalierly dismissed, uh, they are going to be extremely important here, right? And the structure of the nonlinear terms is going to play a, a very fundamental role. So whatever. So when I say in principle, I mean up to the fact that in in reality this has not been studied. What has been studied is the equation in in Schwarzschild. All right. So now. Uh, uh, what remains to do? So the main things that remains to do. So once you have this alpha and alpha bar, then uh, you can really start the game. I mean, you, you have in a certain sense something that replaces uh, the analysis of the Bianchi identities, which was done by uh, Christodoulou and myself. And now uh, what remains to do is to find the quantities that track the mass and angular momentum, find an effective dynamical method to fix the gauge problem, and then uh, determine all the decay properties of the important quantities and close the estimates for the full nonlinear problem, right? So that's, uh, all right, so this is still very hard. <laughs> and there are many, I mean, the, it's hard in the sense that there are many problems that uh, come together somehow. And, you know, in mathematics, you always have to look for the, the sort of the simplest problem that is connected to the hard problem, uh, in which m at least some of the main features difficult feature that you don't understand in the main problem are still present. So as you, you'll see, there are already in, in this axial symmetric polarized uh, situation that I'm going to discuss, there are still a lot of uh, very, uh, a lot of the features of the whole problem can already be seen in this case. Okay, so, so what, what does it mean? I'm looking for metrics. First of all, I'm, I'm looking for stability of Schwarzschild. So Schwarzschild is an axially symmetric space time. In fact, it's, it's, it's not like only axially symmetric, it's also spherically symmetric. And, uh, uh, but it is certainly included in this, what I call axially symmetric polarized space time. So these are the space time for which the metric has this very simple form. Uh, there, are, there is a coordinate phi, uh, which corresponds to a axially symmetric uh, so d over d phi is going to be a Keeling vector field. Uh, so there is some, something here, which is, which is this capital phi, which can be simply understood as being uh, g of zz. So g, this g of zz, g being the space-time metric, so this is uh, equal to uh, e to the 2 phi. And, uh, and then uh, you have a 2 plus 1 dimensional metric. I say 2 plus 1 because it's Lorentzian. So this is a Lorentzian metric. Uh, it's 2 plus 1. 
And of course, it does, the metric here, the metric coefficients do not depend on phi. So this is what the polarized metric is. Of course, Schwarzschild, it's very simple to see that Schwarzschild has this form. If you want a more conceptual definition of this, is any axis-symmetric spacetime where the corresponding z is hypersurface orthogonal. That will have, uh, necessarily, will have to have this form, right? All right, so, uh, so what are the simplifications? So the, the, the main simplifications of these ansatz are that the final state must be Schwarzschild. So you understand, I'm not looking at the most general perturbation. In fact, the, the most general perturbation will have to take Schwarzschild into a, into a care, into a care with small a. And therefore, you'll have to understand, if you really want to understand the full stability problem, you have to understand uh, what happens for, small, for, uh, for all care solutions, at least for small a. So final state has to be Schwarzschild. <laughs> Second, principal null directions are integrable in Schwarzschild. And therefore, we can deal with the geometric setting, which is similar to the one of the stability of Minkowski space, which I'll, I'll discuss. So in particular, uh, the geometric description is based on uh, an optical function. So if you remember, we said uh, yesterday that uh, uh, one of the important ingredients in the stability of the Minkowski space was uh, the construction of a function u, which was uh, a solution of, uh, of this equation, g a b d a u d b u equal to 0. This is the iconal equation. And of course, if you are exactly in Minkowski space, uh, you wanted something which is sort of analogous to t minus right? So, so this was very important because uh, somehow the decay properties of uh, the space time are uh, worse. So this, are, this is a radiation. Uh, radiation component of the, the field, which are uh, very sensitive, and uh, which you have to understand precisely if you want to do a uh, subit of Minkowski space. Anyway, so that, that was uh, uh, one, one thing. So in fact, we can do something similar in this case, as we shall see. So uh, we can use a geometric description based on an optical function and uh, geodesic foliations, which I'll, I'll mention in a second. The, the other uh, simplification uh, that you see immediately in Schwarzschild is that there is a concept of Hawking mass. So it's a, a, a concept of uh, what people, some people call quasi-local mass, uh, which we can write down explicitly, and which is a good candidate to track the final mass, as we shall see. So this is not so much of a surprise. Uh, and then again, we can control in principle the extreme components of alpha, alpha bar based on what uh, I, ha I have already said. So you can imagine that we already have some information about this and we want to find everything else, right? What controls the angular momentum? There is no angular momentum. Angular momentum is zero. No, no, it's zero. I mean, uh, the, 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 once you put this, you automatically have zero angular momentum. Oh, right. That's right. That's angular. And, 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 uh, and another thing that I should have said maybe, is that these components of the curvature <laughs> is actually, I think we said, this component of the curvature is zero, right? It's zero for all these axially symmetric polarized uh, space now, right? So you have only this component, which is non trivial in the case of curvature. What makes this polarized? Well, it's a definition. Polarized uh, is the fact that Z, it's axially symmetric, so that Z and Z is hypersurface orthogonal. So th this is some kind of integrability condition then. All right, so uh, here is a theorem uh, of Seftel and myself. So uh, it says that small axially polarized perturbations, so you have to start with the initial data which are axially polarized, of a given initial conditions of an exterior Schwarzschild spacetime have maximal future development converging to another exterior Schwarzschild solution, which is, uh, GA, uh, which is determined by this new parameter, m infinity. Right? And this is how the, the, the picture looks like. Uh, in what we do, we actually start from the characteristic problem. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, there is a the Schwarzschild spacetime uh, which, which corresponds to, uh, to the M0, which is the one unperturbed. So there is, uh, there is, uh, uh, there is a another line that maybe should have written, which corresponds to the M0. And uh, you construct a spacetime, uh, which is complete. So this is uh, scry. So this is uh, future null infinity, which is complete. Uh, 
you have, uh, in a sense, you can think of having initial uh, condition prescribed here and here. By the way, the characteristic initial value problem can be justified starting also with initial uh, conditions on a space like hypersurface uh, by another result that I didn't discuss. So normally, of course, you, you, should, you should solve the initial value problem on a space like hypersurface. But uh, based on a, on a result of uh, Nicolo and myself, uh, you, you can actually reduce the problem to a characteristic problem in that somehow the space time, uh, if you take initial data, which are small perturbations of, of Schwarzschild, you can show that uh, if you go sufficiently far on sigma 0, so imagine that this is uh, r equal to 2m0, which corresponds to the horizon of the space time you want to perturb. If you go sufficiently far in R, then you can construct a piece of space time which goes all the way to a null hypersurface. Okay? And then the remaining part can be covered just by local existence results. Right? So, so you can always go, you can always go to, to such a configuration. Right? So you can assume that you have data here and here. So anyway, so this is, uh, this is one thing that uh, you have to do. Uh, another thing that you uh, see here is this time-like, so this is, this is a time-like surface, T, which will play a fundamental role uh, in what I'm going to discuss. Okay? In fact, uh, this is, this is uh, the time-like surface where you, you would initialize everything. Okay? So, uh, so this is, uh, let me show you how this is done. Okay, so the key feature of the construction, you use two optical functions, u and u bar, initialized on t, right? So in other words, I'm going to construct a, a function, u, which is an optical function, u equal constant, going all the way to scry, which is initialized here on t. Okay? And another one, which is, which is uh, going inwards. Okay? So they're both starting, from a two surface, so I have tell you I have to tell you what the two surface is, and that's uh, sort of the the hard part. Okay, so uh, so in other words, uh, we foliate the entire space time. Uh, actually, I should say we divide the space time into an exterior region, which is to the right of this T, and an interior region which is to the left. The interior region, you see here, of course, I I have the 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 horizon, which of course. Only a posteriori, I know where it is, right? So in, in principle, when I construct my space time, I cannot use this. But the, the, the whole point of the construction is that we can go further, right? So we can go further, we can go, in fact, all the way to another space like hypersurface, which is A, right? So it's like a sort of an apparent horizon, if you want, but you can go even a little bit further. And, uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, so the timeline surface is 480. So yeah, so these optical functions are initialized uh, on T. Uh, the timeline hypersurface is foliated by a special class of two surfaces, which we call generally covariant modulated spheres. Right? So, so, these are th th so this is the most important part of this construction, is that you have to take the two spheres in such a way that you cancel out certain components of the, of the Ricci coefficients. And in fact, you can see it here. You cancel trace chi minus trace chi bar. You cancel trace, tra trace chi bar minus. So, so this is the average. So when I say trace chi, if I have a function, a scalar function, uh, and I, I'm on a surface, uh, this refers to the average. So one over the area of uh, integral on S of f, right? And then we take f minus this because uh, the quantity trace chi is not necessarily zero in Schwarzschild, right? So you have to you have to take away. Uh, the, the average part, and uh, this is what you want to set to zero. Uh, same thing with trace chi bar. So this is another component of the Ricci coefficient. These are two important components of the Ricci coefficients. And then finally, something else which I haven't yet defined, but which played a, an, a very important role in stability of Minkowski space, which is a mass aspect function. So this is mu is a mass aspect function which is some combination between uh, rho and something else, which I'm not going to write. Okay? But it's, you can think of it as some, some uh, 
variation of, of uh, rho, rho being one of the components of the curvature, right? The, the, so this is exactly the component of the curvature, which is not zero in Schwarzschild. Right, so this, this you have to take, you have to set up uh, them to be zero. And then uh, uh, once you have these surfaces, so these are surfaces that obviously you have to construct. And of course, this, uh, this, uh, this line here, in fact, is not really a line. You have to think about it as being something which is constantly being readjusted. So it, it's a time-like surface which is constantly dynamically being readjusted in the construction. And uh, so once you have, uh, once you have this uh, T and the, the GCMS that, uh, that I mentioned, then you can define from them, you can define an optical function in the, so this should have been exterior here, I'm sorry. Uh, so in the exterior region, so you, you go from this, you go in this direction, so this is u equal constant, and in this direction, which is u bar equal constant, right? And you start here from a two surface, which is uh, one of these GCMS, and then uh, the, in addition, you take an s here, a parameter s, which is just uh, an affine parameter along the null geodesics, which are generating this hypersurface, right? So, and, and here you have u bar, and another parameter, which I call S bar, which is an affine parameter in that direction. So, so it's really a geodesic foliation, I mean, two geodesic foliations that uh, we are using. So, uh, so the next big step, uh, which I'm summarizing, but takes a lot of time, is to show that the knowledge of alpha alpha bar, which in principle we said that we know from, from the work of uh, Dathermos, Holzegel, and Rodiansky, we can, in principle, determine all the other components of the curvature along T, okay? So uh, everything else is determined, and then, uh, then uh, you can take the Hawking mass, which would define like this. Again, everything makes sense because trace chi and trace chi bar now, uh, now make sense at any point of the space-time, right? Through this geodesic foliation, I should, I should say that this is a, this is a, a null hypersurface. And uh, so this, this is defined, this, this sphere is a sphere at a given point, uh, which is defined uh, 1 over 16 pi, 1 r is a, a area radius. So for every, every two surface that uh, we have in this, in this foliation, you can define the area radius, right? Which is such that uh, 4 pi r squared is exactly the area of the surface. All right, so this, uh, everything here makes sense. And now the final mass in principle uh, is going to be deter determined by taking a limit as r goes to infinity of this Hawking mass. So this is the limit as you approach the uh, you approach scry, you approach the null infinity, and then you take another limit as u goes to infinity. I say in principle because of course everything has to be proved, right? So you have to, but at least you have a very good candidate to determine this, uh, this final m, right? So this is of course one of the big things here is to determine the final m. So this will be the final m. All right. Now, uh, all connections and curvature components are determined by transport equations from the initial value on T. So the next step is once I have everything, uh, once gamma and curvature are already determined on this T, I can, through transport equations and elliptic estimates, I can get everything else, right? So I, here I should say that there are some components of the curvature also involved, right? Because remember that in principle, only alpha and alpha bar have been determined, so we have to also talk about all the other components of the curvature. And there you use a Bianchi identities, but now the Bianchi identities is some kind of transport equations, right? Because uh, if, you know, if you know alpha, alpha bar, then you can somehow th think of the others as being transport equations. Anyway, so this is uh, the, uh, all components of the curvature can th therefore be uh, determined. Uh, the space, the space time M, the time I have a surface T, and the two geodesic foliations are cons constructed by continuity argument. Okay, so that's the next important thing to be said. How do you produce these things? So, like in stability of Minkowski space, uh, in st the stability of Minkowski space, uh, maybe I should write it here. Stability of Minkowski space, we, we constructed the space time. <laughs> by starting with a, a space-like hypersurface and then moving on uh, sigma t and uh, constructing it uh, recursively or in, uh, by a continuity argument, so to speak, where you assume that 
you cannot go any further, you have a certain assumption that you, uh, it's called the bootstrap assumption. You assume that you cannot go any further. You take the maximum time where uh, all your inequalities in the bootstrap assumptions are, are, uh, are starting to be violated. And then you, you reconstruct the space time starting from here. So in particular, you reconstruct the U starting from here. So something similar has to be done in this case. And I'll, I'll mention it in a second. Uh, so uh, a GCMS admissible space time is any space time, which is, OK, you'll see it in a moment. You'll see the picture here. Yeah, so this is, this is how the space time is constructed. You, you, you start from uh, these two uh, hypersurfaces, which are, say, initial hypersurfaces. You have to do some work here to show that this point here is a GCMS, right? So it's a sphere that verifies its properties. And, uh, and then, uh, then you construct these two things. And then uh, you construct, recursively, you construct this, uh, this I mean this, uh, these two surfaces. And you say you stop at this level. And then you show that, in fact, you can go further. Right? So the, that's a kind of continuity argument that I, I, I have in mind. OK, so now let's, let's talk about uh, uh, the complete statement of the theorem. So let, uh, complete statement, of course, is, is too much to say, but I like to give at least some <coughs> sense about the th what the theorem says. So you start with the uh, initial layer assumption. So init the initial layer is, is really uh, everything that happens before this. You can go a little bit further, in fact. So in the initial layer, you can assume that you are close to uh, Schwarzschild, right? So that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then, yes? All right, so, and then you have to make, in that initial layer, you have to assume that some norm, and I'm not going to write it down because it's, it's going to be too complicated, and I think it's kind of irrelevant now, uh, you have to take something which involves a large number of derivatives. K large has to be larger than 120 or 50 or whatever. Uh, plus 5, because of what we'll see it in a second, I have to make sure that I take enough. I can lose derivative relative to, uh, to the initial data. So initial data has K large plus 5. Conclusion, there exists a future global hyperbolic development with complete future null infinity. Uh, and future horizon. So the horizon is that red line that we saw, uh, which verifies certain estimates. So of course, the, the estimates are essential. But again, I'm, only, I'm not going to describe it in detail. All I want to say is that there are certain number small, k small. k small is essentially a half k large plus 1, where you have very precise decay estimates in subnorm. Right? So those are estimates in subnorm. And then you have, uh, you have uh, for k large, so you see you lose some number of derivatives. For k large, uh, you have uh, to be a bit more careful in terms of, uh, of uh, how the estimates are set up. Uh, but these are, in, in principle, these are kind of energy estimates. So at the level of the curvature, they are energy estimates. At the level of reach coefficients, they are something else. All right, so then, uh, uh, then in mx now, so you have to look at mx and m int. So we have two optical functions. We have this u and u bar, which have been specified. And relative to, to them, I can now specify the decay properties of the curvature. So this is, these are components of the curvature. Uh, and this, of course, are the information contained here. Okay? And this is without any derivative. Alpha decays like 1 over r cube. r is, again, it's, uh, uh, it's an area function that is it, defined along any point along any point in my, uh, my um, space time. So you have uh, 1 over r cube, u plus 2 over r, 1 half plus uh, uh, delta. So delta dec is some quantity, some small quantity, slightly bigger than 0 that we need to play with, because otherwise you, you, you lose something. In particular, it's extremely important that, for example, uh, these uh, quantities, all the quantities should decay should have, uh, should decay at least, I mean, you can think of u to the minus 1 as being t to the minus 1. And you need an integrable decay. So that you need to beat t to the minus 1 by a little bit. Okay? And that's, uh, that's why I need uh, 1 plus delta, delta dec, because there are many other deltas. 
this delta d corresponds to decay. Okay? So you want a little bit more decay than one. You want integral with decay. All right, so, uh, so uh, I don't know. I mean, for the experts, I can, I can say a little bit more. I mean, uh, the, the, you see that there is very little decay in the interior. In other words, there is very little decay. Uh, in particular, there will be very little decay on, along the new horizon. Uh, you get only this uh, u to the 1 half delta. If you put a, a higher power of r here, otherwise you get this. So there, there is this kind of combination between certain estimates which are, which are better uh, in, the way in, the, uh, in the interior, in other words, when you are near the black hole. Uh, for example, this estimate is much better in near the black hole. But this one is much better if you go away from the black hole, right? So, uh, and you have to play this game many, many times. Anyway, so there are many estimates of this type. And uh, another important thing that I should say is that all our estimates do not improve, unlike in the stability of Minkowski space, where every time you take derivatives in the interior, you improve by a factor of t. These don't improve, right? Uh, and of course, you have to worry that with so little decay, you may not be able to close, right? So that's, of course, another. Uh, issue. All right, on the interior, in the interior part, right, so you have both interior and exterior estimates. In the interior, everything is, uh, there is no r, r is, is 1. Uh, so everything behaves like epsilon to the u bar to the 1 plus uh, delta dec, right? Uh, the, the mass I already discussed will be less than m0. A future horizon will look like this. So it's r is 2m infinity plus. So once you, once you have constructed the entire space time, you can you can talk about the position of the, of the horizon, that the red line that we had in the picture. Decay of curvature uh, on uh, Mx, and so on and so forth. OK, so I, I'm not sure that I should, uh, I should say more about this. Uh, so they, there are estimates in Mint also, in Mx, I mean. Then there is something about coordinates. So you can, you can write down coordinates, uh, which are like, the uh, eddington finkelstein coordinates in, in Schwarzschild. So you can compare with eddington finkelstein coordinates. So uh, this will be the eddington finkelstein coordinates in the exterior part, right? So these are, these are the, the eddington finkelstein co coordinates in the outgoing direction. And uh, relative to them, the, the, the metric will look like this, plus these correction terms. Yes? Sure. Uh, epsilon squared? No, it's a, a epsilon. Yeah, it, it will be positive. Yeah, okay, so we are not very precise. The important thing is that m infinity will look, yeah, m infinity will still be positive. Right. Yeah, okay, sorry, I'm not very precise about it. Uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, these are, again, uh, the interior coordinates in the interior, coordinates in the exterior. Uh, this is a bondi mass law formula, right? So that's what you were talking about, the fact that you have this quadratic thing. Yeah, you're right. So you have the, the bondi mass law formula, which uh, uh, is given, well, I don't know, for, for the, the, the people who don't know, uh, there is this quantity kappa bar, kappa bar hat, which is multiplied by r, and you take its limit. You have to show, of course, that the limit exists, but it does exist. It gives you something at infinity, when r is infinity, which is this var theta bar, which comes up in this formula. So th th this, is, this is, of course, something which takes place along scry, right? So, so you, have, you have scry, and, uh, and uh, you, you, you have a formula which connects which connects the bondy mass here to the bondy mass here. The final bondy mass, which is m infinity. Uh, okay, so now, now uh, I'll talk about uh, maybe the main inter intermediary steps. And I have, sorry, you have a question? Uh, uh, but sorry, but this, uh, you have this axial symmetry. Yes. But this, uh, this thing can move along the axis. So I guess you, you are picking up a frame in which it is not moving. Yes. At the end. Yeah. Relative yeah. to which. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Right. Uh, yes. 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 Yes.
Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, of course, you have to fix up coordinates. You mean you are talking about these coordinates, right? About the, the construction of the coordinates. Yes, yes, that, that comes in there. Yes. Right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, so the main intermediary steps. Again, I, I'm going to go relatively fast, but just to get an, uh, get a sense of what depends on what. Uh, so the first thing you do uh, in step zero, you set up the initial condition. So initially, you just have a layer, and you from that layer you want to construct this C zero and C bar zero. You construct by finding in the layer you find the GCMS and constructing the two. Okay, so that's the first step. And you get you 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 get you get a GCMS. So of course the the fact that you get this GSMS is is highly non-trivial. Uh, once uh, you have that, you you set up a bootstrap assumption, which of course is going to be relative to the the norms you have, right? So the bootstrap assumption is that you you have another epsilon. That there was an epsilon zero in the initial data, right? So this epsilon zero has to be viewed as being much smaller than this one. So you you set up certain an epsilon, which is which bi was bigger than this. And in all your estimates, you are going to use this, uh, this assumption. So in particular, terms which are O of epsilon squared, for example, would be less than epsilon 0, right? Because epsilon squared is less than epsilon 0. All right, so that's the uh, that's first, uh, first thing. And again, the bootstrap assumption is an assumption on a space time which is finite. It's not, it's not you, you are not yet going all the way to infinity. You go, to, you go up to a certain point, and then you have to construct a little bit. You have to construct the space-time a bit further. So, uh, so the theorem number one is that given such a GCM admissible space-time, which verify uh, initial conditions and the bootstrap assumptions, then this equation that uh, uh, I, call it, I call it P before, so this equation can be analyzed. And you can derive estimates for this. And the estimates, again, these estimates, by the way, the estimates for PFRAC are only needed uh, to get decay estimates, right? So you, I'm not, I don't need energy, higher energy estimates. I just need to say that this k small plus uh, some, uh, some number 20, let's say, is, is bounded. So these are decay rates uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for this uh, PFRAC. Right? From PFRAC, in principle, then I can define alpha, I can estimate alpha and alpha bar, which are these extreme components of the curvature. And again, uh, in what I'm writing here, are just estimates for decay. So you separate decay from everything else. You, you, you prove decay for sufficiently number, uh, number of derivatives, but which does not exceed this k small plus 15. So again, these are just decay estimates. <laughs> of course, everything here, uh, you have to think about that everything takes, I don't know, 100 pages, 100 pages of estimates, and so on and so forth. So everything, every step is actually a huge, uh, a huge step. Uh, now, uh, under the same assumptions, uh, you have now estimates for uh, what I call R check and gamma check, right? So we had gamma check. R check. So if you remember, both gamma and R can have components which are not zero in Schwarzschild, so you have to take the averages. So you take away, you take the, the averages, and that's what you get. And you have to show that these quantities uh, verify estimates for k small plus 5. Right? So again, you lose a little bit of derivative at every stage, but it doesn't really matter, because uh, at the end you want to get to k, k small. Uh, and then, uh, 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 so sorry, what was this? So now uh, uh, the estimates. Uh, once you have this this uh, uh, decay estimates, you also go to the energy estimates. So whenever you do the energy estimates, you have to think about somehow at that stage you can use the Bianca identities. Now, now you can. You are in a sense once you once you have made sure that a lot of a lot of uh, a certain number of derivatives of. Uh, of all the quantities are bounded, then uh, you can proceed uh, almost like in stability of Mikoski space uh, in order to get the higher, higher derivatives. And anyway, so this is another step. However, this also is complicated and takes some time. But conceptually, the, the hardest part was to get this. Now, uh, uh, the, ne the next steps are the continuity steps. So first of all, you, you, you define u, just like in stability of Mikoski space. You define the set of values you start. You start with the value of u where you stop. 
you take the value uh, and uh, you look for all s uh, admissible spa space time which verifies a bootstrap assumption. So again, admissible implies that this, you have this T, this time like, sur time -like uh, surface, sur surface which is foliated by, uh, by these uh, GCM spheres. OK, so then uh, you, you prove that there exists a delta 0 sufficiently enough such that uh, uh, you, you have at least something, a small neighborhood of 0, which is just the initial data. So we go a little bit from the initial data. So this is essentially a local result, a local existence result. And then once you have that, then uh, you assume that you can go as far until, until uh, uh, you, you show that, in fact, you can go all the way to infinity. So you, you, if you go to a certain value of your star, you show that there is another value a little bit larger for which uh, the estimates still hold true. And that's, again, that's like in the stability of Nikolsky space. So uh, I have to finish by the construction of GCMS, which I think is the most interesting. Uh, all, the, all the rest, in a sense, is difficult and requires a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of estimates and uh, a lot of miracles that occurring here occur here and there, but uh, but this is maybe the most important thing. So how do you do? How do you construct the GCMS? First of all, you write down a metric, uh, right? So this this is related to uh, Dimitri's qu Dimitri's question. You you write you write down coordinates, uh, theta, u, phi, and r. And you write down the metric in this form, right? So, uh, and of course, you have to have also, in the theorem I didn't say, but of course, you also have to have estimates, very good estimates for all these quantities. And then you, you look for uh, frame transformation, general frame transformation, already discussed in general in the context of axially symmetric polarized space time. That's how they look. You have E3, E theta, and E4. E phi stays the same, right? Because it's the over D phi, this is axial symmetry. I mean, this is a, the uh, polari polarized axial symmetry. So all you have to look are, are this type of transformations. Again, uh, F, F bar, and A are of epsilon, right? So this, you can think about this as being a superposition of a conformal transformation by this E to the A. And then, uh, Loren and then uh, transformations where you keep E3 fixed or E4 fixed. So you, you superimpose. When you superimpose, of course, you get many other low order terms here, which I, I suppress. But you still, you have, for example, this uh, F times F bar will uh, be in principle of epsilon. OK, and then you look. OK, so here is uh, the main point. You look. So you have a, you have a two surfaces to start with. Right, which I call S0, uh, which is part of the old foliation. Let's say that I have my old foliation, and now I want to find, I want to change things a little bit so that I get a GCM. So, uh, so I want to look at the deformation by sub psi. I, I want to look at the deformation into a new, a new surface, which I, I call bold S here. And uh, uh, so this is a psi. And the, the psi in, in this case, which is this axis symmetric polarized case, has this form. So I can write it as u0. So you see s0 is determined by u0 and s0. And I, I change it a little bit by u theta and s of theta. Okay? And theta is in 0 pi. So this sort of fixes the axis. And then uh, the proposition is that given s0 with an r0 is 2m0 plus 1 plus a delta. So again, you are close to the old horizon if you want. Because you want to use a redshift, like you want to use a, the red, you, know, you you want to use the fact that you are in a, you have something of a good sign which is near near uh, the old horizon, and uh, uh, you uh, you construct you want to construct a new surface which a new radius R S which is R zero plus of epsilon, and a compatible frame, right? So I want a frame transformation which is compatible with these two surfaces here. Right? So the compatibility, and of course, which verifies this, uh, this fact, which I, I mentioned earlier, that actually this should be, this is trace chi, uh, which is 2 over r over s. This, this is a trace chi bar. So this kappa is actually trace chi. Kappa is trace chi, and kappa bar is trace chi bar. <laughs> and mu is uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, 
no, this is actually the actual trace, yes? Right. So you take the difference from the mean value? Uh, for this one, I keep it like the, I, I want to also specify the mean value in this case, right? So I specify the mean value to be exactly 2 over r over s, right? And then this other one is a difference from the mean value, which is 0. What does that cost mean? Yeah, so the check means, again, f check means f minus f bar, right? So minus the mean value. All right, so, uh, okay, so the, you, you need an adapted frame transformation. So you want to make sure that you take uh, psi takes e theta into the e theta of s, right? Because you, on s also, you have uh, a natural uh, theta coordinate if you want, right? And uh, uh, so the compatibility says that if I have, see, if I have this, so of course on s, I have the all frame, so at every point I have the all frame, which is E3, E4, E theta, and I want to construct the new one, which is E3 prime, E4 prime, E theta prime. But I want to construct in such a way that E theta prime is tangent to this, right? And the, 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 again, to go from this frame to this frame, I have to use these functions, A, F, and F bar, right? Which is given by that formula, which I, I had it before. But in addition, it has to be compatible. In other words, the C theta prime has to be tangent to a two surface, right? OK, so, uh, so, uh, so this leads to, uh, in order to do all this, you need to do a, a nonlinear elliptic Hodge system. So, so somehow, in order to, so if I'm on S, the condition that I need on A, F, and F bar, such that those three conditions are verified, is a, a, a Hodge elliptic system on A, F, and F bar. Actually, it's not quite, but well, anyway, it's a Hodge system. The Hodge system is coercive, and this is very important. It's coercive because you are close to r equal to 2m0. Otherwise, it will not be true, right? So the, 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 you, you have coercivity because of this. Therefore, this elliptic system, in principle, can be in inverted, uh, and you, you get something. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that because you also have to have, you have to relate yourself also to the psi. So actually, uh, and I'll finish with here, uh, you have to do an iteration argument where you have to look at uh, iterations of uh, uh, quintets, which are formed by a u, an s, an a, an f, and a bar, starting with q0. q0 refers to the standard deformation. You go from s0 to s0, is the identity. And you construct repeatedly, you construct this uh, uh, un sn. Well, assume that you have already un and sn, so the step n. This will define a map which goes to sn, right? So then on sn, I can define this triplet which solves an elliptic system, right? Once I have the elliptic system, so this is the elliptic system. Once I have the elliptic system, I can define un plus one sn plus one by transport equations which are determined by this triplet. And then the hard part is to do the contraction argument, because now you have to compare all these things. And of course, you have to compare things which are defined on different spheres. So this is, this is Sn plus 1. This, so this would be Psi n. This is Psi n plus 1. And of course, now the only way to compare is, uh, uh, between this and this is that you have to ha pull everything back here and do the comparison here. And then you have to work a little bit hard. And uh, that's it. But that's more or less. I think I, I apologize, I went five, minute, five minutes over, so I stopped.